That was the lame Merry Christmas back. But Merry Christmas, Jeremy. You're, well, thank you, Andrew. Um, hope you guys are doing well this morning. If you're not, I hope that uh, uh, today, um, as we gather, is an opportunity for you to be encouraged, um, to be uh, hugged and loved on, um, to express your um, your uh, heart to someone in the room today that can pray for you or uh, just carry a burden with you. So, um, but I'm glad that you are here today, uh, and uh, I would ask you to turn to uh, the Gospel of Matthew, right in the beginning of the. The New Testament, uh, Matthew chapter one, is where we're going to find where we're going to start today. Um, today we're really beginning a journey. I always, I was, I was thinking about that this week. I keep saying every time we start a new series, we're starting a journey, and it really is a journey. But this one is quite the journey, though. Um, we're going to be starting today through uh, the Gospel of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. And uh, um, we're starting today, but it, I'll kind of give you a picture of where we're going. Uh, after uh, we spent most, quite a bit of the year in the Old Testament as we walked through the life of David and then uh, really uh, sort of went back and forth and examined the life of Moses through our Experience in God series, it kind of seemed, seemed right for us to go back to uh, the Old or to the New Testament, to dive back into the New Testament. And I thought, what a better place for us to plant ourselves in this year uh, that we are celebrating and, and, and thinking about um, the, the, the EHBC's 50th year as a constituted church next 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 year in 2024. What a, a, what a great place and an opportunity for us to deep dive into the life of Jesus. Uh, and what better place to do that than in the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew is by no means the most important important gospel, but it is possibly one of the most thought of gospels when you think of it. And uh, it, it's one of the most detailed accounts of Jesus' life and his teachings, uh, and, and especially the end of his life, his death and resurrection. Matthew has one of the most uh, most uh, memorable as well as uh, most detailed pictures of or, or accounts of Jesus' death and resurrection. And so I thought, you know, let's dive into Matthew. And I, and I was trying to figure out, I was telling Andy this week, like uh, up and in, in, in back in November and even back in October, I was trying to figure out what I was going to preach for Christmas. And I was coming up with different ideas. And I thought, well, if we're going to, if I'm going to start in Matthew in 2024, why not just dive into Matthew's Christmas story, the story of Jesus uh, in December? And so this is what we're going to do. We're going to spend the next four weeks, the Christmas season in Matthew chapter one and two. We're just going to take the next four weeks and look at Matthew chapter 1 and 2, uh, and then we're going to take a break. And so from Matthew, and we're going to dive into 2024, and we're going to spend the first several weeks of 2024 uh, really preparing our hearts, preparing ourselves for the 50th year celebration and our mission to see 50 people come to Christ in our 50th year. And so that's what we're going to do in January and just into February. Uh, we're going to be focusing on that. And then in February, we'll pick back up in Matthew chapter 3. So... You guys go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 1 and follow along as we read through the passage in a very unique way. John, cue the video. Okay, cue the... the there we go. Abraham had Isaac, Isaac he had Jacob, Jacob he had Judah and his kin. Then Perez and Zerah came from Judah's woman Tamar. Perez he brought Hezron up and then came. Aram then a man and Dab then Nashan who is then the dad of Salmon who with Rahab fathered Boaz. Ruth she married Boaz. Who had Obed, who had Jesse Jesse, he had David Who we know as king David, he had Solomon By dead Uriah's wife Solomon, while well, you all know him He had good old Rehoboam Followed by Abijah Who had Asa Asa had Jehoshaphat Had Joram, had Isaiah Who had Jotham, then Ahaz Then Hezekiah Amen, who was a man who was 
sleep I don't want to sing this twice Jacob was the father of Joseph The husband of Mary The mother of Christ Isn't that a much easier way to listen to the genealogy of Jesus than for me just to drone on and try to figure out how to say all those names? Yeah, so that's Andrew Peterson. He's one of my favorite Christian artists, and he wrote a Christmas album several years ago. We were, but uh, actually, when I was in college, and uh, he created that song from the genealogy of Jesus. Obviously, there's a couple of parts in that that weren't read. The first verse of the passage is an account of gene- uh, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and then he goes through the entirety of the genealogy of Jesus from Abraham all the way to the birth of Jesus and. Then in verse 17, it says, So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, from David until the exile of Babylon. There are 14 generations, and from the exile to Babylon until the Christ, 14 generations. So my uh, uh, that's that's the genealogy of Jesus. We're going to get there in a second, but I had uh, an interesting story I wanted to tell you guys. My grandmother passed away. My dad's mom passed away in 2020, uh, and my uh, uncles, my dad has three brothers. There's four of them total. They were left with her house, and one of my uncles didn't want to just get rid of the house, so he bought the house, and he started going through things, and he found my grandmother's Bible as well as my great-grandfather's Bible, so my grandmother's father's. Bible. And this is it right here. And so it was kind of neat. My mom, I was at my parents' house a few weeks ago and, uh, and my mom gave me this Bible. And she also gave me my grandmother's Bible and my other grandmother's Bible. And I've been looking through all of them. But as we're sitting at the kitchen table, it was common back then and, and probably is still common in some people's lives. You may do this, but to record birthdays as well as days that people died inside your Bible, just to, as a remember, a reminder of, uh, of, of, of when those people passed or when people were born. And my great grandfather did just that. And so if you open the Bible, there, it, there's in the beginning, there was not the places in his Bible. This is just a New Testament and Psalm, but uh, it, it wasn't a place in his Bible where they had the, the nice places where you can re- record all that stuff. So he just recorded it in like the blank pages in the beginning and the end of the Bible. And then throughout the Bible, there are these little spots where he would record different people's births or deaths. Several times he records all of his kids' de- or, or births and uh, he, he talks about his parents and things like that. But in the very back of the Bible, and uh, uh, as we were kind of reading through it, some of it's kind of hard to see, but he goes through sort of every place that he and his family owned, and uh, then he sold it in this year, and, and then he bought this one, and he lived there for a while. But then there's this one little section. John's going to put it up on the screen. If You probably can't see it real well, but halfway down the screen, you'll see my grandmother is Indian woman. I believe that word is woman. Caught out teepees. And I was reading that and I thought, does that saying that my great, great, great grandmother was an Indian lady who was caught out of a teepee? That's the only way I can figure it out. I don't have any history at all of that at all. I don't know, like, the, my dad knew that on one side of his family he had Native American people, in, uh, he had Native American blood, but he, it, but he didn't know he had it on this side of the family. But obviously he knew his grandmother and knew that maybe that that was her history. Her genealogy goes back all the way to a time when they lived in teepee somewhere in central Kentucky. I thought that was really, really interesting. I don't know the details, like I said, but evidently my great-great-grandmother was a Native American, and I have Native American blood in me some way, right? It's, I thought that was interesting. I thought I'd share that with you guys. But as you read through, I, I also got both my grandmother's Bibles, my great, my grandmother on my mom's side and my grandmother on my dad's side. And, uh, and as I've been reading through and fingering through those notes, I can see they, they wrote notes in their Bibles. They have highlighted portions of their Bible. And each one of those is like a fingerprint 
um, in, their, in their life pursuit of Christ. Both of my grandparents were believers in Jesus. Both of them lived the life of faith. And I, I, I look through those Bibles, I look through this Bible, and I see those, that evidences, and it just, just kind of sees this heritage of faith in my upbringing, as well as some other things, obviously, right? And by no means would I ever say that my lineage is full of godliness, that, uh, that there's with, it's without its fair share of drunkards or criminals or knuckleheads in general. But there is something special and significant about knowing where you come from, isn't it? Some of you probably know you're where you come from, and maybe you've traced some of your lineage through one of your grandparents or great-grandparents' Bibles as well, as you can see when people were born and when people died and all that kind of thing. You might look at Ma the first half of Matthew chapter 1 and think, that's a weird way to start a story, right? Well, why would you start a story like that? I and mean, we have four gospel accounts, and Matthew is the only one that starts with a genealogy, right? The section of Scripture, like if you go back to the Old Testament and you find a genealogy in the Old Testament... You're likely not going to be sitting there looking through every name and just, just, just thinking and, and, and figuring out how that name connects to this name and all that kind of stuff. It's probably a section of Scripture when you're reading through the Bible that you skim through or maybe you just turn the pages right through, right? Because what, I mean, I don't know what that's, I don't even know how to pronounce those names. Let alone sit and study and figure out how those names are significant, right? But when Matthew sat down to write out his story, write out the, the, his account of Jesus' life, write, write out the, the, the story of the greatest man that's ever lived, right, the God-man, Matthew felt it was important and significant to include these names, to include this list, knowing how significant the names included in this list would be to those reading his account of Jesus' life. When you think about the Gospel of Matthew, when you consider any of the Gospels, all the Gospels were written with a purpose. They, they have a purpose behind them. There, there's, the author intended this, this, this book to be re read by a certain group of people. Obviously, he, it, God intended it to be read by us 2,000 years later. But then Matthew sat down to write his uh, account of Jesus' life. When he went through the years of trying to, to pull together all the resources that he had and write down all the memories that he had had, 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 had in the life as he walked alongside Jesus, Matthew said, the first place I need to start is the genealogy of Jesus. So people reading this would understand. See, Matthew's writing to a Jewish audience. Jewish people, some of which had given, had put their faith in Jesus, had began a relationship with Jesus. They had heard about the Messiah. Maybe they had followed him at some portion during, uh, during, his, or during his time on earth, during that three years of ministry where he was going from one place to the next. Maybe they heard him preach on the, uh, the side of the Sea of Galilee or whatever. And, and, and when he died and when he was resurrected and they found out about Jesus, they said, this is the one promised in the Old Testament. This is the Messiah and I'm going to follow him, right? That, there were some Jews reading Matthew's account of Jesus' life that had given their hearts and their lives to Jesus, put their faith in him as the promised Messiah. And there were others that would read this book, that read this account of Jesus' life, who were considering putting their faith in Jesus. Jewish people considering putting their faith in Jesus. But you've got to understand the risk at this time. Matthew's writing somewhere in the second half, maybe somewhere around 60, 50, 60, 70 A.D. And there's some debate on when that was actually, when it was actually written, actually penned and, 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 and finished. But in that time, it wasn't like a super popular thing to be a Christian. It wasn't a, a super popular thing amongst Jewish people to, to, to what they felt like was to abandon the Jewish faith for this rabbi who was a rogue rabbi who was creating a, a tumultuous situation amongst the people. They're getting them in trouble, right? And so there was a risk and a cost of believing in Jesus. And it was high risk and a high cost. They could lose friends. They could lose positions and prominence in society. They could lose their family. Their family could see this as them turning their backs on them. And they even risked their own lives. So imagine those reading this. 
They knew the Old Testament. They had read the Old Testament. Many of them had memorized large portions of the Old Testament, right? They knew the names. Imagine those reading this, seeing these names listed, remembering the promises made through the men and the women listed in this lineage. They were significant. As I was reading through the names listed in this Bible, my dad was saying, oh yeah, I, I, knew, I knew that aunt or uncle or I'd heard stories about that. Or I remember <clears throat> that's where my, uh, my mom's name came from. There, my, my grandmother's name was Minnie Pearl. She predated the, the, the Minnie Pearl. Yeah, she's predated that one, okay? They were born around the same time, so obviously she, she was Minnie Pearl before Minnie Pearl was Minnie Pearl. But nonetheless, um, my, my, but there, there was a, a Minnie and there was a Pearl and all those things written right here in this Bible. And so you start to see the connections as you read the names. And, and, and you can imagine those Jewish people reading these names and saying, oh, yeah, okay. Oh, I remember that story. Oh, I remember that name. That's a significant name. That is from the lineage of David. They must have been asking the question as they're faced with this decision of whether they're going to follow Jesus or the reality that they have decided to follow Jesus. They've decided to give their life to Jesus. They had to be struggling with that question. Is he worth it though? Is he worth it? Is he really who he said he was? And, and is he the one we have been waiting for? Is he worth all of this? And so Matthew, sitting down to write out his letter, said, Listen, I want you to know that he's worth it. I want you to know that he is who he said he was. That this is clear that Jesus is the king who has come from the line of David. He is the king above all kings. He is the promised one. He is the Messiah. And he is worth it. In a sense, what, what Matthew is doing in this genealogy for these Jewish readers was saying, listen, this is the worthy king. He's worthy. And I want to share with you three things that I think Matthew wanted us to, to get grasp. And I think you'll see this all throughout the rest of the book of Matthew is that, G that Jesus is the worthy king. He is the worthy king. And the first thing that we need to understand is he is worthy. He is worth knowing. He's worth knowing. Matthew intentionally picks 14 generations between Abraham and David and then between 14 generations between David and, and the exile to Babylon and then from 14 generations from the exile of Babylon to, the, uh, to, to Jesus these 14, this number 14 is significant. And it's really intended on pointing to the Jewish people, pointing back to the Davidic line, right? Because the, the prophecies tell the, 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 the Jewish people that the king, the Messiah, would come from the line of David. He would come from the family of David. He would be a king in David's household. And so Matthew, as he's looking through, because here's the thing about the, these, the, 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 people, the, the, the generations that Matthew chooses. He, he chooses 14, 14, 14. But the reality is there's more generations. There's more names that he could have chosen. But Matthew's intention is to show the lineage of, of, of Jesus and then to point, Jesus, point the, 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 the person of Jesus, the man who was born, back to this line of David so that those that would reading would understand that this is the one. This, this is... This proves that he is from the line of David. And these names and stories have a purpose to show us the significance of the lineage of Christ. Each one of the names was, has a purpose. He intended on us catching a picture of these names. Now, if you look through, you'll remember, you'll, you'll remember some of the names that are mentioned. Obviously, Abraham and his sons, and even going to Judah... You've probably heard Perez and Zara, maybe. I know you've likely heard the name Tamar if you've been in church much of your life. You, you likely have heard the name Boaz and Ruth if you've read through the book of Ruth, right? This, the, this Jesse and his son David, most of us, if you've been with us uh, for any season of time, we've looked at the life of David. 
But, but then you get into like Solomon. Of course, Solomon is the, the son of David, but then also the author of the Proverbs and, 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 and Song of Solomon and, 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 and a prominent person. But then you get to Rehoboam. And then you start reading through some of these kings' names, and you're thinking, why does he include Rehoboam, and, and, and why, why does he include Ahaz, and, and, and what about that Manasseh fella, or Amon, right? I mean, Josiah's a good guy, right? Hezekiah, but he's a good king. But then you've got these knuckleheads, these evil guys that are mixed in with the good guys. You have these prominent characters like Abraham mixed in with someone as sort of um, inconsequential, if you will, as, Jeho uh, as Jeconiah or uh, Shealtiel, who fathered, fathered Zerubbabel. And we don't know much about any of those guys, right? But all these names would have been profound, right? Would have been important as they were reading through this genealogy. See, the lineage of Jesus, the lineage of Jesus tells a really amazing story that can be described really in kind of three ways. The first way is it's profoundly miraculous. From the very beginning of Matthew's tale here, Matthew's lineage, you see miracle as a definition of the lineage of Jesus. Abraham fathered Isaac. Abraham and, 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 and his wife, Sarah, were advanced in years, well beyond the years of childbearing when Isaac was brought into the world. You remember that, 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 that Abraham had received a promise from God and God had said you were going to be the father of a great nation and then 30 years passed and no child had been born. And by the time Isaac's born, they're advanced in years and then God in, in his wisdom and, and, and his uh, providence says to Abraham, go to the mountain and sacrifice your son on the mountain. And through his obedience, Abraham brings Isaac to the mountaintop. And, and, and before he drops the, 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 the knife and, and kills his own son, the one that was born by a miracle, God saves Isaac. All these things are pointing towards Jesus, the birth of Jesus. Foreshadowing the, the even more miraculous birth of Jesus and, and foreshadowing the death of Jesus. When the Father, Father God, was sacrificing His one and only Son for those who would trust in Him, and He did not keep the knife from falling. So there's a profound, miraculous element to the lineage of Jesus, but there's also quite a colorful and not very suitable uh, sort of picture for a king as well. If you look through, we've already talked about the, the kings and the, and, the, and the bad men and the evil and the knuckleheads that were a part of Jesus' lineage. But there's also four women that make up the genealogy, um, all of whose stories are wrapped in sin and scandal. The first one you come across is Tamar. She was the daughter of Judah. And she was the one that tricked Judah into sleeping with her, which in turn produced these twin boys, Perez and Zerah. If you don't know that story, basically Tamar's husband had passed away and, uh, and, and she was to marry another uh, one of Judah's sons and that son didn't want to have a child with her. And, and because of that, Tamar decided to take things into her own hands. And so she disguised herself as a prostitute and, and she basically took advantage of Judah. And from that came Perez and Zerah. The next is Rahab. She was a prostitute in Jericho. Not quite the, the, the pedigree of a king, right? But God chose her to be the mother of Boaz, an, an important piece in his story. And then there's Ruth. Ruth is the mother of Obed, the wife of Boaz, but she was a Moabite. Moabites were known as a group that was, that, that was known for their sexual immorality. So after her husband dies, she is left wandering as a widow with her mother-in-law, and they end up in, uh, in Israel. And by God's providence, she meets and marries Boaz, becoming the mother, another mother in the lineage of Jesus. 
a Moabite. She isn't even a Jewish person. She didn't have the right blood at all. And then there's finally, there's uh, Bathsheba. An innocent woman taken advantage of by King David who murdered her husband to cover up his sin. And she's chosen to be the mother of Solomon and is woven into the story of Jesus. And each one of these women, though their stories uh, are, are there, there's many stories that, that they could list, these women stand out because of how proud, profoundly real their stories are and how, how much they display God's amazing grace because their lives weren't worthy to be included in the lineage of the king. Like, if you think about it, none of these women, their lives weren't worthy enough to be included in the lineage of the king. And yet, by God's grace, by God's mercy, they were made a part of his story. It's only by God's grace and only by God's mercy such colorful crew could be included in the family of the king of kings. But that's the heart of the gospel, isn't it? The center of God's good news. You aren't invited into God's family because of any merit you can claim or, or gain through your own means or your own efforts. God's in, God invites us into his family only by his grace and only by his mercy. And that's what makes him worth knowing. See, as Matthew's writing these names down, he knows the, the situations. He knows the characters. He knows that this isn't the pedigree in the Jewish world. But he knows that these names that are represented here point to us that this Jesus is worth knowing The invitation into his family doesn't mean that you have all your stuff right and all your, 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 your pedigree marked, but rather that by God's grace and by God's mercy, you can be a part of his family as well. He's worth knowing, and you can see in his story because it's perfectly planned and orchestrated by God. Regardless of how crooked and knotted Jesus' family tree may seem, history is not an accident or a coincidence. God used fearful men, sinful women, selfish, irresponsible kings, and some straight-up evil dudes to write his story and, and brings his presence and his salvation into our broken world. Jesus is a king worth knowing because his story is a story of hope and a story of joy and a story of peace and a, joy and a story of salvation. It's a story worth knowing. He is a king worth knowing. He's also a king worth following. Unlike your typical biography, the Gospel of Matthew isn't a detailed chronological history of Jesus' life. That may come as a surprise that if you read the book of Matthew or really any of the Gospels, you're not necessarily reading a detailed history of this man's life. It's not a biography as you would pick up. He was born here and then he went here and then he went there and then he went here and then he died here and all that kind of stuff. It, it, it has an intention and a purpose. Matthew chose various stories and recorded different teachings that Jesus taught in order to accomplish his purpose of showing his readers that Jesus truly was and is the promised Messiah and the worthy king. That's his agenda. That's his purpose. And the structure of Matthew begins with this genealogy and the account of Jesus' birth and his baptism and his temptation in the wilderness when God tests him through, or Satan tests him and tries him in the wilderness. But then in chapter 5, he begins the first of five teaching blocks, which is really kind of the structure of Matthew's gospel. Matthew structures his gospel around these five teaching blocks. And he has an intended purpose behind that because the, the, he has stories and, and, and he has uh, descriptions of, of Jesus going here and there and, 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 and what he does in these places. And then he stops and he has these moments where Jesus teaches. In chapter 5, the beginning of his teaching block, we know as his, uh, his, his Sermon on the Mount, which we studied last year. These, dis these discourses, each one of these discourses teach us what it looks like to be committed and convicted, steadfast followers of Christ. What does it look like to be a disciple of Jesus? And that's Matthew's intention, his purpose. He's saying, listen, he is the king, 
Now this is what it looks like to live in his kingdom, to live as one of his, his disciples, one of his followers. What does it look like? How does your life need to look? The first block of teaching comes in chapter 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus teaches the reality of a radical everyday discipleship lived in the presence and the power of the king and his kingdom inside our everyday world. What does it look like just to be a disciple, to, to walk with Jesus, to, to, to live as Jesus would call us to live? What does it look like to pray? What does it look like to fast? What does it look like to, uh, to, to, to live uh, uh, out the values of the kingdom of God? That's the first discourse. The second discourse comes in chapter 10. And in, that, in chapter 10, Jesus teaches his disciples about their call and commission as missionaries to a lost world. It's a whole missionary discourse of him saying, this is what it looks like for you to live on mission for me. Then th the third block in chapter 13, where Matthew records a number of parables. Jesus is teaching his disciples how to live in a world that isn't yet fully submitted to him as Lord and as King. He's saying, You're, this, this, is, this is how you are to live in, in, in my kingdom when it doesn't look like my kingdom at all. Like, I don't really rule here, but this is how you are to live in this world that seems to be against you. The fourth discourse is in chapter 18, and it's all about the church and all about community. W what does it look like to live in community as a disciple of Christ? How do you deal with conflict? How do you deal with marital strife? How do, you, how do you live in community with one another? And then finally, the fifth discourse is the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus has his final meeting with his disciples before he goes to the cross. He shows them how they should live with heavenly hope and expectation which is an appropriate message before he goes to the cross because I imagine all of those that were listening didn't understand what was about to happen. And so that Jesus is teaching them about expectation, about, about the hope of heaven and the hope of heavenly reward and, and how to live in this, this, this world that is coming to an end. And then the next day he's on the cross. See, what, what these discourses do, not only is Jesus, Jesus a king worth knowing as we read about where he came from and how he was born in human flesh and all the stories about his journey, what we see in these teaching discourses that he's a king worth following, living according to his ways and embracing a way of life that, 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 that promises to be an abundant life as it's lived under the grace-filled authority of Jesus Christ. What Matthew is doing, he's saying, this is what it looks like to follow Jesus. He is the king. Now this is how you should live. And finally, I think Matthew wants us to understand that he is a king worth sharing. As one of Jesus' followers for most of his three years of ministry, Matthew had experienced Jesus in a way only a handful of people were able to experience him. And I think his life is clearly transformed, right? Much like anything in life that transforms us, the natural response is to share what changes us with others, right? I mean, when you have kids, your life is dramatically transformed, right? In great and difficult ways. But every chance you get, you will most likely share with others just how beautiful and precious your baby is, right? Just how awesome and how amazing your kids are because your life has been changed. So for years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, Matthew worked to put together an, an, an account of the life of the man who had not only changed his world, but had changed the whole world through his life, death, and resurrection. From the death and resurrection of Jesus until Matthew writes and, and, and in a sense publishes his gospel, Matthew had likely spent these years compiling all of the things that he wanted to include in his gospel because he wanted it to be a profound message of the man that had changed him and changed all of the world. We'll see through the gospel Matthew's painstaking intentionality to show those reading just how gloriously good and profoundly powerful Jesus was. 
he couldn't help but share because he was a king worth sharing. There are likely other ways for Matthew uh, to end his account of Jesus' life. The other Gospels ended differently than Matthew's Gospel, but Matthew had an intention and a purpose in ending his Gospel the way he did. He chose to end with the call Jesus gave his disciples before he ascended into heaven. The Great Commission is a call to share Jesus with the world wherever we are, whatever we're doing, and whoever we're with. This king who was born in a manger in Bethlehem wasn't like anyone who had lived before him or anyone who would ever live. And so Matthew is saying the king told us to go and share him with the nations. And so he is a king worth sharing. So go and share him. Matthew's intention in beginning his Gospel the way he did was to show us a king worth sharing, a king worth following, and a king worth knowing. And throughout the gospel, Matthew encounters three groups of people. Three groups are it's prominently in the background of every story and every teaching that Matthew records. The first group is the religious leaders. You see them all throughout the gospel. These were those who were antagonists, who refused to believe Jesus is the Messiah, and who refused to submit to him as the worthy king. There were the crowds. Everywhere Jesus went, there was a crowd that followed him. Everywhere he taught, it seemed that there was a crowd listening. The crowd were those who follow Jesus as long as he gives them what they want or entertains them in the moment. But ultimately they never decided Jesus is worth submitting their lives to. They just stayed as the crowd. But then there were a few, the disciples, who were the true followers of Jesus, who listened to Jesus, who learned from Jesus, who submitted their lives to following Jesus, even to his death and their death. Because they had come to understand that he was worthy of not only knowing, but following and sharing as well. So as we sort of, as we close this time out together today, I want to, and, and this is the question that is going to continue to come up as we go through the Gospel of Matthew. Who will you be? Who will you be? Will you be like the leaders? Will you reject Jesus? Refuse to submit to him as king and say, you know what? That might be good for you, but it's not good for me. Can you, can you to come, or come up with another argument or another reason why this whole Christianity thing is just bogus and, and, and isn't worth anything? Or will you be like the crowds? You'll casually observe Jesus, look for ways to maybe use him to get what you want or to feel better about yourself and come to church or come to an event or, or do the things that you think are expected of you. But at the end of the day, never really submit your heart and your life to Jesus. Just follow him at a distance. Or will you, like the disciples, find him someone worth following and will you conditional, unconditionally follow Jesus as we learn about him as we understand him as someone worthy a king worth knowing a king worth following a king worth sharing will, will you submit your life to him and then will you do the next step the, the step that Jesus calls us to do is not just to, to know him and not just to follow him but to share him as his disciples did at the risk of potentially losing friends, at the risk of potentially losing your job or, or definitely being uncomfortable in the places that you are sharing him, will you submit to sharing him? There's a song by the same guy that wrote the Matthew Bogots song. 
you've probably heard it. Chris Tomlin redid it and a couple others redid it. But it, it's a song that, it, it's a worship song that asks a question and he answers it. And the, the song is, is, is he worthy? And you, it, it, the chorus basically goes, is he worthy? And then with a resounding, triumphant answer, it's, it, 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 we proclaim he is. And so that's my encouragement to you. Can you say in your heart of hearts, like, can you truly say, yes, he is worthy? And not just say it with your lips, but say it with your lives. Is he worthy? Yes, he is. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you are worthy. Thank you that you are good. Thank you that you are gracious and merciful and you're mighty and powerful and you are also humble and kind and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, God. Thank you for the truth of who you are, God. Lord, right now as we, God, as we sing, I pray that our hearts would be drawn towards singing of you, God, because you are worthy, God, and that we would sing with hearts that... Um, God, are free from guilt, free from shame, free from um, God trying to, to, to fit into um, some kind of image that we've created for ourselves, God, that people may like us or accept us, God, but that we would, God, be people who um, care more about you than we care about what others think of us, God. God, I thank you for the Christmas season. God, I thank you for the reality of your birth and the reality of your life, God, and, and, and the significance of it. God, help us to reflect and help us to, to, to even dwell and, and to, to meditate on your life, God, that, that, that you came to be, uh, that you came into existence, that you didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but you submitted and, and humbled yourself to become a man, to live a life life that we could never live and, and die a death that we, God, deserve to die, that we could know you and have, have, have salvation in your name. God, I pray that all those truths become uh, sweet truths this Christmas season for us, God. For those in this room, God, who may be in that first group of people, God, or maybe even in the second group of people, maybe they have been antagonistic to the gospel and, and today something changed or in this season of life something has changed and, uh, and maybe there is a, 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 a desire to know more, God. Through your spirit, would you reveal your name to them? Would you reveal your face to them, God? Soften their heart to trust you, God. And for those that are in the crowd, that are following in a distance, listening but not ready to respond, God, I pray today that they would move from just crowd to disciple. And for those of us in this room who are disciples, God, I pray, uh, God, that you would just draw our hearts closer to you, Father. God, draw us to hearts of submission, that we would trust you and, and give our lives to you, Father, again and again knowing that in, in you is where abundant life is truly found, God. We thank you for your grace. And we ask all this in Jesus' name.